From our houses in Los Angeles, California, it's Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, your comedy field guide to life. Tonight, the world of cults. Being a passionate follower of something that is deeply irrational. Wait a second. Aren't we describing fans of this show? No. Therapist Rachel Bernstein is here to talk about how ordinary people can become seduced by conspiracy theories and end up in a cult. Queuing on anyone? We're here to do the research, and I'm proudly wearing my shaman fur and horns. Plus, show descriptions. Nobody's have sent us their attempts to describe this podcast. Tune in to find out how our cult following describes the supreme happiness, sexual gratification, and lifestyle perfection that this podcast brings to their lives. You can text a donation to 866 Poundstone. I'm Adam Felber, the man who every week tries to organize our conversation into carefully sorted topical cups of Kool-Aid that I suggest you drink to find paradise. And now, please welcome the woman who never drinks the Kool-Aid, but always drinks the Diet Pepsi, Paula Poundstone. Hey, you guys. Welcome, Paula. Oh, it's it's so nice to be with you. Uh, It's great to have you here. Oh my gosh, we had a little scramble before we began recording with looking for wires and I didn't have the right, my phone wasn't charged and there was, oh, it was that like thing that just makes you tense. And you know what? I think that my animals pick up on my stress level sometimes what makes you think because, so? um, well, my dog Mo has been scratching a lot lately. Um, uh-huh. And then I noticed today, like on her arms, I think she actually has hives. Um, but so for about the last week, um, I've been rubbing a little bit of olive oil, uh, on her armpits. Um, okay. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's oily. I, Cause I think some of it, I, well, prior to today, I thought some of it might've been dry skin. And then I realized, well, maybe she's licking the olive oil, you know, just for the <laughs> taste. Yeah. And so... <laughs> So now I've just been putting olive oil on my armpits, and I feel so much better. <laughs> and my dog seems to feel better. Uh, it seems to it seems to have helped her for for me okay. to have olive oil on my armpits. So I I feel good about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the dog no. yeller. That's what I am. You're not a whisperer. Well, you've never been a whisperer. No, not much. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's nice. Um, I want to recommend. Remember to use um extra virgin olive oil. Oh yeah, I don't judge. Um, hey Adam. <laughs> yes, Paula. I also want to say thanks to tonight's house band flautist, violinist, and fiddler Madeline Eaton. She's a member of the all female Celtic band Bancara, based in Southern California. Hey, I think I've heard them practicing. I think I have too. I wonder if there's any um, Southern Californian bands currently uh, in Ireland. No, I don't think so. Because there's always Celtic bands around here. All right. Well, um, Paula, you know what else it's time for? And I'm very excited about this. It is time for our book club. Oh, I'm Yay! so excited. <laughs> Wait, hang, hang on a second. I have to find my gavel. It's around here somewhere. Uh, here it is. Here it is. You know, I I promised that I would look into whether the gavel sounded good or not, um, and I didn't listen to it. So, Bonnie, how did you feel about the gavel last week? I thought it was a little weak, Adam. A little weak? I, I shall try <laughs> to bang flim- with more alacrity. A little, yeah, a little it, was, faint? it was a little flimsy sounding. Well, let's, how's this then? Order, order. No, it uh, sounds like we're going to have a, ra- a rain dance. <laughs> <laughs> Be that as may, as president pro tempore of the club, I brought out a copy of Robert's Rules of Order because we have a habit of disintegrating into parliamentary chaos. Robert's Rules will prevail tonight. You're out of this- order. You're out of order. You don't get to do that yet. This meeting is called to order. Can I ask for unanimous consent to approve the minutes from the last meeting? You're out of order. You're out of order. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. In naval team. Aye, aye. The eyes eyes have it. Is there any additional old business? Well, 
there is a, a, a little bit of business. Um, oh, Adam, business. answer the phone. What? Answer the phone. This yeah, is highly out of order. Order, order. All right. Hello, hello. Uh, hello, hello, Adam uh, Compasshead. It's uh, it's me, Bernie <laughs> Sanders. Bernie Sanders, you're still calling me Compasshead, uh, Senator Sanders. Welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you very much. I've been reading uh, Moby Dick uh, along with your book club. <laughs> oh, you have? I, I well, was, that's great. I was hoping yeah. I could join. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I understand that John Favreau from Pod Save America has yet to <laughs> respond to your invitations. It's, it's not even clear I, whether he knows that we're uh, having a book club. Well, I think that's a shame. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure that he knows all of what he's missing. However, in regards to the book, I would just like to say that in addition to being an environmental disaster, the yes. whaling industry cost lives, disrupted families, and was not, in the aggregate, a healthy workplace. I, I think that's probably true, Senator Sanders. Um, uh, I, I have trouble reading the uh, book as well because um, I'm against whaling. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a positive. Uh, it's not a. It's it's not good. Well, yeah, but uh, l- let me ask you. Uh, sh- as a senator, I'm not quite sure why your opinions on whaling are really that valuable because you are in a landlocked state. <laughs> it's not the point. I'm joining you in the book club, and that is. Oh, not, right. uh, uh, I am the uh, democratic <laughs> socialist arm of the nobody listens to Paula Poundstone book club. I was pleased to be glad. It's great to have you aboard. Do you have anything that you want to say about the uh, about the book other than uh, whaling being an unsafe workplace? Uh, not at this time. I will wait my, my turn. Uh, I believe we're uh, using uh, Robert's rules of order. Yes, yes. Well, to the, to the best of our knowledge, we are. We're not quite very good at it yet. Um, but, I did uh, want to say yes. one thing. You're out of order. You're out of order. No, that's not it. That's not how you do it. <laughs> Uh, by the way, in fact, uh, Senator Sanders, in, in fact, you're out of order because we're still doing old business. Oh, uh, my, my mistake. We, we've, uh, we, but if you want to hang on the line and uh, take part as, as you may, you're welcome to do that. I do. I do. I would like. Uh, All right. Uh, well, it's great to have you. Um, excellent. Well, let's move on. Does anybody have any old business besides the approval of the minutes, which we've already done? Well, I'd like to defer to Paula Poundstone. <laughs> is that? Oh my God! Is that, is is that, that Senator is that, Senator Klobuchar is here? <laughs> yes, and I'm so glad that you had Bernie be here too. This is a really high-powered book club now. I'm yeah, so yeah, excited. really. We've got two U.S. senators. <laughs> um, well, wow. welcome, Senator yeah. Klobuchar. But um, we are still on old business. So if I, Tony. Uh, Bonnie, anything from last week's meeting that we need to talk about? T-shirts, well, maybe? Yeah, I know where you're going. But I wanted to say this one thing before <laughs> we went to the T-shirts, which is... Yeah. Okay, so I happened to cross the movie The Crown... No, The Queen the other day, which ended up being a good movie. But it prompted me to go over and read about Queen Elizabeth. So I wanted to share with the club, because, you know, the clubs get together and they share... Did you know that the when silence, the, uh, silence, you're out of order, Bonnie Burns. I, I, this no, is no, actually no, you being have, out of you order. Have to let me. I have my time, right? Okay, I'll say this really. No, quickly. this is new Did business. You, know, you can't. No, you can't bring on. new business. I can't to start a story and then stop in the middle of the story. <laughs> what I the fuck does this have members. to do with Moby Dick? I, <laughs> <laughs> I think we should okay. better tell the rest of the story. The Queen was not in Moby Dick. <laughs> and your story would be new business, not old business. You are violating both book club and the rules of order. <laughs> I think we should let her tell the rest of the story. <laughs> Senator Klobuchar, you stay out of this. I don't even know how you're here. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, Bonnie, tell the rest of the story. Okay, really fast. When the when the queen has like a baby, has children, the one that's going to yeah. be the heir apparent is called the issue. And then the ones that don't get to be the king or queen are called the detail. How mean is that? Hmm. So like Prince Charles was the issue and Prince Harry was the detail. 
Bonnie, no what wonder in they... God's name does that have to do with anything? <laughs> it doesn't. I'm just sharing. And now I'll go on to the titles for the T-shirt. <laughs> My you know, God, you are you honestly, are one hundred percent resistant to the rules of order. I am this fucking close to joining the Republican Party. <laughs> I don't blame you. Me too, Senator Sanders. All right. Okay, I'll get on what with else? the business. Right, I'll get on with the business. So we yeah. were talking about a fundraiser. We were talking about a fundraiser, and we left things that. We decide on a, you know, one fundraiser was a T-shirt, and we decide on a slogan. So these are my two top picks. They both came from Paula. One was join the book club, no cover. And the other one was the book club where you don't have to lie about what you read. But I vote for the first one because it's shorter, and I think it'll look better on a T-shirt. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I uh, let me uh, propose an amendment that it should have some. It should say something about nobody listens to Paula Poundstone too, like join our book club, no cover, and then maybe on the other side it says nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. That's what I think. And what should be the graphic? Like a book with Adam and Paula's faces <laughs> inside. Yeah. How about a book with our what? Well, how about a book with our logo on it? No. Oh. That's a good That's idea. That's a good idea. That has both the name of the podcast and our images. We could just create a book version of our uh, beloved square logo. And then on the back, we could just put a picture of John Favreau with the big question mark. No, what about an X? <laughs> All right. All in favor of approving um, fundraising chairman Bonnie Burns' design for our T-shirt, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The eyes have it. And no, Yay. I'd like a voice vote. I'd like a voice vote. I, I'm not sure that was accurate. Uh, objection overruled or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, let's go. Are there any other pieces of old business? Boy, you are this close to being a Supreme Court nominee, the way you're handling this. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any overruled other old or business? Whatever. <laughs> uh, any, uh, uh, well, of course, uh, y you know, we could use a new report from the Treasury. Well, that would be um, new business. Oh, is it? Okay. And let, well, so carried. Let's move on to new business. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, uh, Club, that I'm so glad that you are not using uh, corporate interest uh, uh, for, for, for funding your club. <laughs> well, we, we will fund our club any way we can. And, and to get to that, new business, Paula Poundstone, how is the, uh, how is the, um, what's your report? <laughs> Well, we just got a huge endowment from Exxon. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm sure Senator Sanders uh, isn't happy to hear that. <laughs> that, is not, that is not right. That is not right. Uh, <laughs> is there, they're they're going to ask that you read pro, <laughs> yes. pro oil books. That, that There's going to be influence on the club. A lot of pro well, oil books. Like, well, uh, Moby Dick, Dick is Derrick. absolutely pro oil. In fact, uh, in the chapters that we're supposed to be discussing today, um, Ishmael um, offers a sweeping uh, defense of the entire whaling industry. Yes, uh, this is something I very much object to. <laughs> okay. okay well. <laughs> Compass head. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, new business. Once again, uh, we're, de we're dealing with chapters 23 to 28. We're hoping to get to them. Uh, Tony Nita Hall, what do you have for us? Yeah. So we met Starbuck. That was exciting. You know why? I didn't know Starbucks was named after Starbuck. Oh, you mean the it first mate? Was? The, 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 the coffee chain is named after the first mate? Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it's named after the first mate. They almost called it. The other names were possibly Cargo House or Pequod for what we now know as Starbucks. Was the founder of Starbucks a big fan of Moby Dick? I guess. <laughs> there was a spinoff company that get the creamers from uh, Quequod. Quick, 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 quick creamer. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator Maybe Sanders or Paula. Whoever said Maybe that. Maybe Starbucks could sponsor our book club. <laughs> oh. That is an excellent idea. 
I, I, I love that, that Tony idea. Anita Hull. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping Tony Anita Hull can join uh, my next campaign. Uh, I'll be running for president again in <laughs> 2024. Really? Yeah. You're going to be running against Joe Biden? You're going to try to primary Joe Biden? Uh, Joe Biden doesn't want to run again. Uh <laughs> In fact, what we're going to do is do. tag team. Um, you know, I'm I'm in excellent health. I had one heart attack, and uh, yeah. most people didn't even know that I had a heart attack. All I said was, "Could I have a chair?" <laughs> I, I, I have to I have to quibble with that a little bit, uh, Senator Sanders, because in fact, almost everybody knew you had a heart attack. Not in the moment, they didn't. Because no, not they in knew the moment. when I went to the hospital, yes, Compass said they knew then. But uh, in the moment, there was no chest grabbing, there was no screaming, there was no rolling in pain. I simply said, could I have a chair? <laughs> well, that's uh, amazingly <laughs> stoic of you. That doesn't necessarily qualify you for the office of president of the United States, but it's impressive nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, Paula, do you have anything to say about those chapters? I can't believe we're actually talking about the book a little bit. Uh they were good chapters, excellent chapters. Uh, we inter- yeah, we met Queequeg. We met uh, who was the other guy with this? Did the other guy with the pipe in his mouth all the time? What was his name? Stub maybe or something? Uh, uh, the guy with the pipe in his mouth. Didn't we meet the guy with the pipe in his mouth? I think we did meet the guy with the pipe in his mouth. What was his name? Yeah. I, I can't remember. We we did meet him. Like, I, I, was it like it's been a, stub been a couple or of weeks since we read it because we didn't get to the chapters last week. So now I've kind of forgotten. yeah. We didn't get to the chapter because <laughs> there was so much business to be done last week. Yeah, that's I know. The this problem, week we, that's cl- the problem with business. It takes over everything. It's corporate interests dominate everything. Senator Sanders, uh, we're trying to discuss the chapter here. Sorry, um, was I out of order? You're out of order. You're out no, of order. No, you're out of Come order. Sec- Senator Sanders, you're out of order. I just want to say one more thing. I, I don't care yeah. about the damned emails. Yeah, we know that. Yes. There's a you're lot talking of about symbolism. Hillary's emails. A lot of symbolism in Moby Dick. Uh, to me, the Pequod is our nation. Okay. And that's the symbolism. Okay. And so <laughs> when <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought you were going to take that uh, metaphor a little farther, but apparently you're going to leave it right there. Um, all right. Order, order. I'm going to move oh, on and read our is, absentee president, Ken Lezebnik's uh, 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 entry. Is Stubb the guy with the pipe? I think Stub? it is. I don't, yeah, Stubb. I just wanted to, Stubb. Just wanted to clarify. I think that. it was. Yeah. Yeah, you just Googled it, Tony. Did you um, Google it? <laughs> I did not Google it. Bullshit. Oh. She can't not Google. She Googled. <laughs> I always have All the right, book order, open order, in front order. Of me. This is uh, Ken Lezebnik. He sent us a postcard. And I, and I, I want to read his message because he works very hard on these postcards. Quote, I've been pacing the quarter deck of my brownstone reading of cetology and smoking my pipe but it's made for mild white vapors among mild white hairs not among torn iron gray locks like mine i'll smoke no more i'm off to the fulton frankfurter king in search of the great red wiener what the hell paula i'm uh i'm concerned you know when when ken says he'll smoke no more i don't believe him at all he's smoking now yeah, question is what's he is. smoking <laughs> oh, boy. Given this entry, I don't know. Yeah, All right, off um, looking for the great red wiener. He understood <laughs> the symbolism. What would a great red wiener be a symbol, a symbol for, um, Senator Sanders? Moby Dick, what's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> order, order. I am calling to this week's book club to a close. Adam, answer the Do phone. I... Answer the phone. No. Answer the phone. <laughs> that, that, we're, we already have Senator Sanders on the phone. We got a lot of um, lines. Go ahead. Pick up the other line. <laughs> we have another line now? Okay. Hello? <laughs> hey, Adam. It's just it's just me, Mike Bum Bum Bonifay. Uh, oh, man. That, it's, it's great, great, red, great Red Wiener. Get it? Get it? <laughs> yeah, Mike, I get it. 
Yeah, I get it. Like Moby, yeah. It's like Moby Dick, man. I love that guy, Ken. Where the hell is he? Right. Where's he? I love, geez, he's funny. I love that guy. Hey, red, uh, gray Mike. Red, red wieners like Moby Dick. You didn't get that? <laughs> I, I I got I got that I got that. <laughs> Mike, did you have anything else? No, man, I, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'm really busy. Uh, uh, it's okay. Good talking to you, man. Love you. Well, I have officially brought the book club to a close, and I think we might have officially brought the book club to a close today. That went really <laughs> well with the Roberts Rules of Order. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna study up my Roberts Rules of Order, and I suggest that everybody else do because I, you know, you are a hard bunch to run a meeting around. I'm gonna have to go. I, thank, uh, you, thank, uh, it was, thank, uh, you. thank you for closing the meeting. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, edifying. It was edifying. That's what it was. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, glad you enjoyed it. Feel free to come back anytime, Senator Sanders. Th- th- thank you very much, and I appreciate your use of Robert's rules of order. <laughs> you, well, you're welcome. <laughs> thanks, and Paula, Senator do you have Sanders. A... Thanks, Senator Sanders. <laughs> Paula, do you have a? Can you bail us out with a vocabulary word? I have a word, Adam. It's assiduous. Yay! It's it's an adjective that means showing or done with thoroughness uh, and and great care. Here, I'll use it in a sentence. Um, <clears throat> I could not find my glasses despite my assiduous search. Okay, we got to get this word into the vocabulary song. Is uh, is Miss Nancy on the phone? Yeah, hi, it's me, Miss Nancy, Fairbanks Elementary School second grade teacher. Wait, Miss Nancy, aren't you supposed to be teaching right now? Not right now, Adam. The kids are at recess. Of course, we're doing the distance learning, which means they're sitting on their asses playing video games. Before the pandemic, they'd be on the yard right now, and I'd be in the teacher's lounge having a cup of coffee while while I sharpen pencils. Okay. Um, well, uh, maybe one day that'll happen again soon, Miss Nancy. But are you going to uh, sing the song for us? I, I am. I better get going before my break is over. Uh, yeah. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Uh, Paula, can you do the... Uh... Yeah, hold on, Miss Nancy. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think I got it. All right, here we go. Um... This week's word is assiduous. It's an adjective that means showing or done with thoroughness and great care, like how I carefully backcomb my hair. Last week's word was lubber. It's a noun that means a heavy, clumsy, stupid person. Once you've called a friend that, your relationship may worsen. The week before that, the word was ubiquitous. It's an adjective that means present, appearing, or found everywhere. So many men are growing facial hair. Going back before that, the word was obstreperous. It's an adjective that means noisy and difficult to control. Mo won't stop barking at people when they stroll. And not long ago, we had evanescent. It's an adjective that means, um, I had it a minute ago. I can almost see it. Smells like Evan. No, that's not it. Oh, quickly fading from sight, memory, or existence, like crews reflecting on the time they tried to kill Pence. Let's never forget <laughs> Gallimaufry, which Paula pronounced wrong until nobody James Haider corrected her. It's a noun that means confused jumble or medley of things. Hodgepodge, who's podge, hodgepodge. Adam doesn't think her song is replicable, <laughs> replicable, <laughs> replicable, but she does, she does, she does, she does. Whoa. Wow. Woo. Well, that thank you, Miss Nancy. That is really special. Thank you, Miss Nancy. Oh, oh man, my Lord. I re- I gotta go. I gotta go. The kids, are, the kids are coming back on the screen. All right, it was good talking to you. It was fun doing your vocabulary song. I'd love to do love it the- again. Yeah, uh, you you'll get to do it again soon, I'm sure. Wow, our phones are getting a workout tonight. Goodbye, Miss Nancy. Bye, Miss Nancy. Bye, bye Tony bye. Anita Hull. Bye, Captain Crinkle. Okay, bye. Bye, bye Adam. Miss Nancy. Bye, Miss Nancy. 
Coming up, Frank Zappa said the only difference between a cult and a religion is the amount of real estate they own. We'll find out if there are other differences between a cult and a religion. That's next on Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. Do you ever listen to our podcast? Of course you do. Do you ever listen to our podcast, however, and wish you could interrupt us? Well, now you can. We're going live on the Stereo app, where you can ask us your questions directly on the app. This has been really fun. Every Friday, Paula and I have been choosing a different question, like what movie scared the crap out of you, or do you have any really bad cat stories? And we go on the Stereo app live and talk about it, and you, our beloved <laughs> nobodies, have been chiming in with your input and stories, and we've been playing them right there on the air. That's... um. Go, go to Stereo.com slash Adam Felber or Stereo.com slash Paula Poundstone. Sign up and join us on Fridays. Join us on the Stereo app for our usual uncensored opinions and exclusive content. Very exclusive. We're very exclusive, but you can join. If you just go to Stereo.com slash Adam Felber or Stereo.com slash Paula Poundstone, sign up. It's free. No obligations. Get notified every time we go live. On this day in unremarkable history, Clarence Thomas's wife said, Yes, I get it. Briefs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, house band Madeline Eaton. Paula, people are believing some weird shit lately. Oh, my gosh. No kidding. You know, it made me wonder, what is a cult? And how do you know when something is a cult? And, and how do you help people get out of a cult? Well, by outstanding coincidence, we are fortunate to have an expert here on that very topic. I don't know how that no, happened. Rachel Bernstein. Weird. Yeah, the thing that we were just talking about pertains to the guest we're about to have. Weird. <laughs> Rachel huh. Bernstein is a marriage and family therapist with a specialty in those leaving cults and high control groups. She has worked with victims of cults and emotional abusers for 27 years and believes that given the right set of circumstances, anyone can fall prey to sociopaths and manipulators. She is the host of Indoctrination, a weekly podcast covering cults, manipulators, and protecting yourself from systems of control. Please welcome Rachel Bernstein. Yes. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I was truly looking forward to it. Oh, great. Well, we're so glad you're here. So let's 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 tee up a, a good question right off the bat, which is what is a cult? It's a great question, because if you look up the word cult in the dictionary, it's not really going to define it the way I define it after doing this work and from what we've seen now in the news and stories that we hear. So what it is, is an organization where you have to give unquestioning devotion to the teachings and to the leader. No critical thinking is allowed. No individual thought. Only group think, group speak. It also needs to become your entire life. So you can't join a cult and be into other things. It is the thing that becomes your life and then becomes more important than anything in your life and anyone in your life. It also gives you a whole new identity and it's defined by the group or the leader, what your new identity is, sometimes giving you a new name, a new family. And also it defines your inherent value. So your value is based on how useful you are to the group and how self, self-sacrificial you're going to be to the leader. What makes it also really wow. dangerous is, beyond all of this, is that there's no ethical core. There's no legal core. So what is right and what is wrong, what is legal and what is not, is defined by the leader, not by the state or the country that you're in any longer. You're also never allowed to say no, have any boundaries, have no privacy, and they're they're never done with you. So you might graduate, but you graduate to the next level. The only way you are able to get out of a cult is when you decide you need to leave or you have someone help you escape. Wow. Wow. I got to tell you, when I looked up cult in the dictionary, it said, ask Rachel. (laughs) And now we know why. (laughs) Yeah. Now we know why. Wow. So, so if if any of those attributes that you just listed are lacking, it's not a cult. Well, that's a good question too, because what we're dealing with is sort of kind of most of the characteristics you're going to see in most cults. 
you're going to see um, this level of deception that actually is a thread that you see in all cults. You never know what their true intention is for you when you get involved. They will lie to you in their recruitment of you. They'll lie to you while you're there. So you really actually don't know anything about the group. You really, people in cults know the least amount about the group they're in because they're not allowed to access information that we can access about their group. So you're gonna see a lot of these characteristics and a lot of the ones really have, again, this thread of deception running through all of them and control and relinquishing of control. Are, are cults legal? Yeah, they are, which is, it blows my mind. I mean, one of the reasons that they're legal is that there aren't enough laws to kind of help people mm, be protected from things that are invisible. I mean, I don't know how you really can prove that you were under undue influence. It's a very hard thing to prove. And the abuse is something that's also quite invisible. And so you also have within cults that well, a lot of the people that I've treated don't know that they were abused because it was called something else in their cult. Mm -hmm. So they never went to the police to say they were being abused or neglected. They thought that was love in their group or they thought that was what they deserved. And so uh, the amount of abuse and neglect gets really underreported in cults. So a lot of cults are not held up to any kind of microscope or really any kind of mirror, but there are more laws protecting cult leaders than their victims. A lot of cults oh, wow. will say, you know, like they can cry religious persecution if you go after them, if they're seen as a religion or have tax exempt status. And that's that's happened uh, many times over and over again. Well, that brings up a good point, which is why is a religion different from a cult or is it? Right. So what I think is important when you look at cults now, they've become very strategic and also in finding ways to keep their secrets. Usually when you get involved in a religion, they're not going to have you sign waivers right away and sign non-disclosure agreements um, like a cult will. There are many people who have been truly hurt, have wound up in hospitals or in psych units because of their experiences within groups, have wound up being quite suicidal. And then they will sue their cult and lose because they've signed all that paperwork. And so when you think about a religion, Yes, there are some fundamentalist branches of religion that do look pretty culty and mm -hmm. they act pretty culty. They, they do. One of the things that seems to be this difference is, well, two things. One is, again, if I were, let's say, to become Orthodox, Orthodox Jew, I would know right. what's expected of me, right? I would, I would know what I'm allowed to eat or not and what, where or not. Within a cult, you're never told the information ahead of time, and that's on purpose. So the leader can always berate you for getting it wrong and keep you dependent on them for guidance and make you feel that you can't trust yourself. That's the gaslighting part of it. And so within a religion, you're told up front, listen, this is what we expect of you, you know, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And I think also with a religion, usually, not always, but usually, there's a governing body, an outside source that you can go to to complain, and an ethics board, somebody. And religions are supposed to follow by laws. And within a cult, they're renegades. There's no one watching. The cult leader can get away with anything, and they do. And that's how they do. No one is watching what, what they're doing, and there's no one to report to. Now, in your... Um introduction, uh, mm -hmm. Adam said that, that you felt that under the correct set of circumstances, anyone um, could fall prey to a cult. Um, but I was wondering, are there common recruits? I mean, are there, is there a type of person that they look for? Right. I just want to point out that the Kitty Poo Club is much <laughs> more like a religion. You can take it or leave it. Uh, I just want to say that right here. That's one of our sponsors, so I'm yes. glad that you think they're not a cult. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I've enjoyed my association with the Kitty Poo Club, and I never signed anything. And uh, you can you can take it or leave it. Wow, it's weird because I did sign something, and I have pledged um, 
I pledge no. eternal <laughs> allegiance to Kitty Poo Club's leader, Glenn. Glenn. Um, no, I and think I wait if for you my look, orders from him every week. If you look carefully at the form, it's spelled differently. It's not the same. All right. So oh. sorry to interrupt, uh, <laughs> which I have a tendency to do. All right. So is there a kind of person that they, you know, that they they look for? Right. So I think uh, there are a couple of ways to answer that. One is that when I think about cults, most cults are run by um, people with narcissistic personality disorders, not all, but most. And so it's just like what a narcissist is going to look for. They're going to look for people who they think are going to be good recruits. Um, in fact, before answering that question in particular, there is a little story that I wanted to tell you about a client of mine who's a narcissist who's trying to work on it. And he actually said to me, I test people right away. I test to see what I can get away with. I will purposely bump into someone and if they apologize to me, I know I can control them. And wow. Gosh, is, is he, has he changed at all since he's now he's not president? Um, a, li a little. <laughs> a little. <laughs> uh, it's a hard sell, though, to do therapy with a narcissist. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. But I thought that's fascinating because cult recruiters are very similar. They're going to look to see who's open, the one who apologizes for things that you did, that you said, the one who's willing to be introspective. And so it's really people's better qualities. And sometimes just being very open, maybe if I were to be at all critical, and I don't mean to blame the victim, but maybe a little too open at times without really knowing what to watch out for and, and the red flags. But you also, and this is why it can happen to anyone, you also have people who are much more vulnerable at different times in their lives. And, yeah. right, so they might right. be away from home for the first time or they just got a diagnosis that was scary and this group offers them a chance for health uh, or um, being able to live forever or whatever is speaking to them in that mm -hmm. moment. And so, you know, that's why everyone can be vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that Mr. Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore Show was a narcissist. But he did confess one time in one episode that he hired Mary, not for her education background, but because she bumped into a desk and she said, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. To the desk. <laughs> yeah. That's a wow. Surprisingly fascinating. relevant reference there. That no, is no, when you say everybody could be vulnerable for a cult, how about the kind of people who are potential cult leaders, the narcissists? Are they vulnerable to become cult members? Uh, right. So some of them actually have learned from each other. Some of the people who have gone on to lead their own cults were members of followers oh. of others. And oh. they thought, oh, I can do this better. I've learned how to control people. I now know this theology or technology or whatever it's called. I know it's Scientology. It's called their tech, their technology. And I'm going to start my own group. And so they are still within the programming. They're still kind of under the spell, but they've started their own group. But typically, these are people who really usually answer to no one. And they find a way to cushion themselves and have this sort of protective zone around them where they can get away with anything and say anything and change their mind and abuse people and go off and fly off the handle. And no one will bat an eye. And part of the reason that they set that up is because narcissists do whatever they can to defend against the sort of narcissistic injury, which can be anyone just even saying no or maybe to them instead of an emphatic yes. And so most cult leaders cannot be controlled, but I still do watch out for the ones who have risen to the top of particular groups and kind of in the number two spot. Uh -huh. And so I'm trying to keep track of all these sort of tentacles that reach out in different directions from that one source, from that cult. I'm no expert, but from the little bit that I know, some cult leaders um, can be impeached, but not uh, removed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah um, that's definitely a thing. That's what I've heard, yeah. yeah. I've heard. It's just something I picked up along <laughs> the way. Um, uh, so what are uh, common recruiting techniques? Right. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that they talk about is this idea of love bombing. And it's where people feel very much attended to and someone really looks into their eyes and wants to incorporate them into some kind of 
mm, connected feeling of community and we are involved in something that's important and you feel elevated. And, and then also there's the hard sell because cult recruiters are really expert business people. They're very good at the hard sell that you need to make a commitment now before you've mm-hmm. had a chance to think about it, don't go home and think about it. Don't talk to people. Don't read the forms we want you to sign. And they want you, again, to get involved right away. Mm-hmm. And, and so then you really don't have time to think. And they'll usually surround you with other people. It's like people selling a who, car. Like selling a car. Like selling a car. But they, they then. Really, they, they want you to not leave that showroom mm-hmm. right now. And if you act right now, I can get you this deal. I probably can't get you this deal tomorrow. That's why I have six cars. <laughs> so, right, and I, I think the other part, I mean, that maybe this also happens. Oh, seven, with cars. sorry, I just bought one. Seven, one. seven. Yeah, just, okay. just another one. Okay, so maybe it, this might be similar or different from cars, but what they will also do in terms of their recruitment is make you feel like the answers only exist here. You will be making the biggest mistake of your life if you give up this opportunity because there's this idea of influence that's called scarcity. So Mm -hmm. we have the answers. We are the only way. And it's been proven and they'll give all these false senses of, you know, false correlations to... The country is in a terrible place. It has so many problems and only I can fix it. Exactly Hmm. right. I wonder where I heard that before. Right? Exactly. Probably at a car dealership. At a car dealership, right? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But I think the other thing that makes it interesting about about recruitment is that they will promise you things that are unmeasurable, immeasurable, undefinable. Um, Like they will give you the sense that you can um, have self-actualization or salvation or enlightenment or spiritual healing, empowerment, and have a state of mindfulness. And what does that mean? They're, to me, they are not meaningful terms because there's no way to find out if you've reached that. And then right. you're yeah, depending yeah. on another person to tell you when you've reached it. And if you're paying money into that group, they'll make sure you never reach it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, the less reasonable a cult is, the more men seek to establish it by force. Stay tuned to find out more about cults and how they get established. The Cat of the Week is Joey from Cairo, Egypt. Rothy's comfortable, washable, and sustainable shoes and bags make getting dressed easy. I was not having a hard time. I like Rothy's shoes, but I have to say, I was not having a hard time getting dressed. Well, there you go. I mean... If you weren't, great. You still get the great Rothy style. But if you were, you also get that. Rothy's has transformed over 75 million bottles into beautiful shoes, handbags, and face masks. Another major bonus, Rothy's are fully machine washable. Simply toss them in the washing machine, and they come out looking as good as new. You know, so I got a pair a while back. They're they're a kicky pair of flats. I've actually never had shoes like that before. The kind that show the top of your feet. Uh, you know, your, your the cuffs of your pants come down, and then they show the top of your feet. They're kicking. Rawr. Yeah, they're 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 comfortable and uh, easy. You know, throw them on, trot about. <laughs> Check out all the amazing shoes, bags, and masks available right now at rothys.com slash nobody. That's rothys.com, R O T H Y S dot com slash nobody. Style and sustainability meet. To create your new favorites, head to rothys.com slash nobody today. If you're going to do it anyways, use our code. Stress, sleep, recovery. These things shape how we perform. And I know that I have had a problem with getting to sleep uh, pretty much my entire adult life. And worse, in recent years, just because I work, I also get up kind of early. So I have added to my daily routine, and it's helped make a noticeable difference, New Calm. And it's this system where you get to unplug from the rest of your life, calm yourself down, and, and, and get your brainwaves into a position where you can actually fall asleep. I love that. Yeah. 
Stress is unavoidable, and it's imperative to your health and happiness to be able to manage stress and not be managed by it. Stress, you are not the boss of me. New Calm gives you the power to slow down and get some distance, which will allow you to respond better to the demands of everyday life. New Calm accomplishes this by interrupting acute stress at its source and by bringing you into the calming brainwave patterns that are associated with relaxation, greater awareness, intuition, and provide a calming sensation. NuCalm is clinically proven in over 1 million sessions to improve your sleep, reduce your stress, and boost your recovery without drugs and side effects. The NuCalm system uses cutting-edge neuroscience and consists of three non-invasive and non-pharmaceutical items, all of which are included in your monthly subscription that costs less than a daily cup of coffee. The whole process is easy to use and to work into your daily routine to achieve better sleep, reduction in stress, and boost in recovery. Do what I did. Own the day with NuCalm and make 2021 the year you manage your stress better. We have a special link set up specifically for our listeners. Go to paulanewcom.com and get 50% off your 30-day subscription. That's a good deal. Your 30-day subscription of Newcom and their money-back guarantee. That's Paula, N-U-C-A-L-M.com, Paula, N-U-C-A-L-M.com to get 50% off your 30-day subscription. Do it. And we're back with therapist Rachel Bernstein talking about cults. Hey, Rachel, um, I have listened to a a podcast series called Sounds Like Hate, and it's made by Southern Poverty Law Center, and Mm. um, it's about hate groups. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was really struck by was there's a terrible organization called The Base, and um, they somehow got like 80 hours of their phone conversations. And a lot of it was these recruitment uh, conversations. And and they all said the same thing. You know, when they said, well, why do you want to join? Um, and they would say, uh, you know, where I live, nobody is like me. Uh, I, you know, my family doesn't really understand me. I don't have anybody to talk to. I really want a group of guys around me that I, you know, that understand me. So it, it, clearly they're filling a hole with this idea. And um, I wonder during the pandemic, uh, given that there's more isolation, do you think that increases our overall vulnerability to things like cults? I think the fact that QAnon and other groups like it have grown so monumentally is because of this perfect storm. It's because people are feeling disconnected. It's because people are feeling fearful. There is a pandemic and they also don't know whom to trust because politics have been so divisive. And um, I think also people only have their computers now or their phones to stay connected to the world because they're dealing with so much isolation. So groups have grown exponentially and I've, I've never been busier. I get 10 to 20 calls a day from new people wanting to talk to me or needing to talk to me. Um, Which reminds me, um, could we just take a minute right now? Adam is really bothering me. Is there a, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> I was just wondering. I didn't if we, consent to a session, Paula. I, I was just wondering if we could take a few minutes. I don't know if no. it's appropriate, <laughs> it's but not. I was just wondering it's, if no. we could work out. Okay, I never would rather mind. not. Never, okay. never mind, Rachel. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that because <laughs> that's what keeps our relationship healthy. It's, it's good. Just, right? It's this, it's this uh-huh. friction, this constant friction. <laughs> Now, has there ever been a group like Q, as long as we're talking about it? I mean, because Q doesn't have a leader or not a leader that they're allowed to know. Yeah, they think it has a leader. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, QAnon and, you know, other groups, again, like it, um, have this whole kind of conspiratorial thing and they're looking for scapegoats and it can get scary. And, you know, it's usually the same old, same old scapegoats. But with QAnon... 
because there isn't an obvious leader, I think what that does is when, when there's an absence of information, we as human beings fill in the blanks with what we want uh, to be true. And so I think it's added to this sort of magical deification of mm -hmm. the leader because we don't know that there's someone in their mom's basement. We haven't seen them. And so, and, and it could be also that part of the appeal has been that a lot of things have been given out in riddles. And so people feel like they have somehow deciphered something like it's the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like it, it sort of uh -huh. raises to this level of importance, even though none of it makes sense. Right. And I think it, you know, and also what, what I think is scary about a lot of it um, is that within these groups, once you're already kind of strapped in for the ride, the crazier idea, the more believable it is, which, which is hard for people to kind of understand from the outside. But yeah, why is that? So there's something about when you introduce an idea that's pure mythology, to people on the outside, they'll say, that's ridiculous, that's crazy. But crazy no longer sounds crazy to a lot of these people because if you're in the mindset, you think, that sounds so crazy, and who would make something like that up? It must be true. Like Their Pizza mind Gate. has flipped. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. <laughs> Let me refocus us on, on the Q thing for just a second because I want to make the logical segue, which is the, the QAnon – theory was that 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 Donald Trump was the only hope to fight um the, this child pornography and murder cult right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um let's segue then into talking about how Trump support in general is or isn't like a cult right so you know i remember when uh trump was elected i mean it was a it was a hard evening for a lot of people. I remember eating all of my leftover Halloween candy. That's sort of how I handled it at the moment. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> I'm I'm really impressed that you had leftover Halloween I, candy. Right? Good for you. I think I get the kind I don't like. <laughs> so, all the way in November. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Uh, at the same time, uh, I got a lot of calls and emails from um, former cult members who said that the sort of the hair is up on the back of their necks. They can feel the similarity. Wow. And I started looking at this and I started taking all these characteristics that I apply to cults and seeing all of them play out. And it is a fascinating thing. It's very disturbing. You can see how easily people can be influenced too. I mean, one of the things, well, here are the things that I noticed about the Trump presidency. First of okay. all, with, within cults, there is this divisiveness. A cult leader will set up a competition so that there is this sort of false war going on that you get very involved in. And there's a hierarchy and you're always jockeying for a position and you have people you can't trust and the people you can trust, it's very black and white. And you, you then are supposed to be fighting each other, which the cult leader loves. They sort of sit back and watch it all happen, this thing that they've created, which I think mm -hmm. Trump did as well. You're also not allowed to question. If you question, even if Trump said mm, something was blue on Monday and said it was green on Tuesday, you can't question that because if mm -hmm. you do, then there's something wrong with you or you're being difficult or you're being argumentative, which also happens within cults. Everything's turned back on you. Also, no one is safe. Only the leader is safe. Even the people who are the most devoted and the most self-sacrificial will like, be thrown under. Like the under... vice president who's loyal for exactly. four years. And he, he could be murdered. Right. Yes. Yes. Without question. And, and that is just, you think about it through the narcissistic lens. There is no one who's allowed to be a threat. There's no one who's allowed to get more attention. There's no one who's allowed to be more right. Right. And, Remember when yeah. they wouldn't let um, Fauci, they wouldn't let Fauci go on the sun Sunday morning television shows um, mm -hmm. when they were giving those daily um, briefings mm -hmm. and Trump didn't have any information. Fauci had the information, but Trump would go on and say whatever. And they wouldn't let Fauci go out because he might say something that Trump didn't say. And it was going to give him a lot of attention. Oh, Yeah. 
And the ones who were the most demonized, I think, within this administration, including what happens in cults, are the ones who are the most talented, the ones who are the brightest, the ones who people are going to connect with and who are going to trust and who are going to listen to. They threaten the leader. The leader doesn't care about you having honest information. The leader cares about being the source of your information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have within a cult, a lot of people who just learn to coast, they have somebody in charge, they go into automatic pilot, and they have someone who's fighting their fights, who they think is taking care of things. And it's a regressive state, I think. It's like you have this dad or this mom who's in charge, and you can be in the back seat, and they're driving. And Gosh, so, wouldn't that be great, by the way? I, it would Don't be you lovely. really wish such a That's thing were possible? Lovely. Like, just that somebody else had the answers, and you could just kind of kick back. <laughs> that would be delightful. Yeah, um, that is a great idea. And I think the other thing is that the rules only apply to everybody else. So within a cult and also I think with Trump, so he could get away with anything. The rules don't apply to him. The laws don't apply to him. And so he's developed a team of attorneys. He's developed the loopholes. He's developed the the intimidation and the fear tactics to make sure that he can keep getting away with things. I was very nervous, and I also got lots of calls from former cult members who were very nervous during the time of the first impeachment trial when nothing happened because I thought, oh no, this is where you start to create more of a monster. Because it because, reinforces the idea exactly. that nothing can happen? Oh, exactly. wow. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. when things started getting really ugly, even uglier. Do you think that flies are attracted to uh, <laughs> to high level cult followers? Is there anything there? Um, no, I just think that was a lucky coincidence. <laughs> okay, uh, here's a practical question: What can you do for cult members? You always read that you you can't just talk them out of their cult. What can you do to help somebody who's in a cult? What's the best way forward? Right. It's true. You can't just expect to do that kind of intervention. I mean, I do do interventions, not the kinds that you see on TV where it's a whole bunch of people sitting in a room and they're talking to the person who has the issue. That's never mm -hmm. going to work with a cult member. Um, so what I think you want to first think about is that a lot of people who have left cults have already been emotionally and spiritually out for a long time before they were physically out, before they had the nerve, the confidence, the bravery to actually leave. So you don't want to then be critical of them and come on too strong and say, I told you so, because you're going to push them right back into something they were already questioning. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you help them see what they have been kept from seeing and to say, I don't necessarily need to be right. Uh, I don't need to call what you're in a cult. But there's some information out here that is available about the group that you're in that you haven't had access to. And I would love out of love and respect for you, to, for you to be able to have access to it. And then you can make up your own mind. And this is how I define a cult. I'm not saying the group that you're in is in one, even if you're sure that it is. But uh -huh. why don't you then, if you go back or you think about your time, think about these characteristics and see if they were present there. And then you'll have a full picture. So Ooh, help, help the people to see things for themselves. Because if you just pull someone out of a cult into another direction, you're not any better than the cult leader, right? You're just yanking them in another direction. So I, I like to be able to I would, help I would say you're still a little better than the cult leader. <laughs> right. Not the way well, I do it. <laughs> yes, you are a little I, better. I right, say, you're I said, get out of that group and now sign this. <laughs> uh, that's probably not the that's right approach. Um, wow. Well, Rachel Bernstein, your insights into cults are fantastic. And we are now, stand back, we're going to take that information and run it through the old pounce donator. Paula? Okay, house band Madeline Eaton, thanks so much for being here. You sound terrific. Could you kick in a little background music and I'll tell you what the Pounce Donator spit out about cults. Um, you might want to write this down, you guys. Um, it's a little, uh, you know, it's a little wallet-sized identification package. If your devotion must be total and you enter with a secret yodel, it's a cult. 
If you're not sure what's expected and live in fear you'll be rejected, it's probably a cult. If outside laws don't apply, but you're forbidden to ask why, it's a cult. If the leader is a liar and democracy hangs by a wire as a result, guess what? It's a cult. If you're worthless because they say so and critical thinking is a no-no, it's time to catapult because it's a cult. <laughs> she is a therapist and host of Indoctrination, a weekly podcast covering cults, manipulators, and protecting yourself from systems of control. Rachel Bernstein, thank you so much for coming on our show. Uh, thank you, Rachel. This was so Woo-hoo! interesting and relevant and uh, you're really wonderful. That, so the podcast is Indoctrination. Um, I, I want to tell nobody listens to Paula Poundstone listeners um, that if they have signed the form that I asked them to sign, um, they can <laughs> listen to Rachel's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Coming up, show descriptions. Nobody's trying to encapsulate the gestalt of nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. Can it be done? We'll find out. That's coming up after this. We deserve to know what we're putting in our bodies. Like right now, I'm eating a shoe. We deserve to know what we're putting in our bodies and why, though. That's the trick. You got to know why, especially when it comes to something we take every day. Ritual's clean, vegan-friendly multivitamin is formulated with high-quality nutrients in bioavailable forms your body can actually use. So I took Ritual Vitamins, and uh, they were easy to take. I felt good. I, uh, they, they're not the kind of chalky capsules that stick in your throat, and even though the vitamin might be good for you, you feel nauseated all day because of that powdery stuff. Um, they smell good. They have a little minty capsule in there to keep away the fishy smell. Um, so they're very takeable, and I felt good. Well, then uh, that proves it. Now available for women, men, and teens. It's science. I'm using science. (laughs) Ritual multivitamins are scientifically developed to help support different life stages. And your ritual multivitamins are delivered to your door every month with free shipping. Always. You can start, snooze, or cancel your subscription anytime. And if you don't love Ritual within your first month, they'll refund your first order. It could just be that my life didn't suck for a couple of weeks. It Uh, could be a coincidence, but I'm... I'm telling you, I, I did. I felt I felt good. I'd go. I t- It could have been Dumbo's feather. I have no way of knowing. No, because ritual. There was, there, I, it would, yeah, it's, it's science. It could be this shoe that's now lodged in my throat. Get key ingredients without the BS. Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Three months should give you enough time to figure it out. Uh, visit ritual.com slash Paula to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash Paula. If you're going to do it anyways, use our code. Only 8% of New Year's resolutions survive the whole year. Those are long odds for a lot of important goals like, say, eating healthier. This year, you deserve a little help in the healthy eating resolution department. That's why Kenko. Kenko makes seriously nutritious smoothies for seriously busy people. Kenko smoothies are easy to make. No blender, juicer, or kitchen needed. You don't even have to have a kitchen for heaven's sakes. You make it in the living room. Pour the Kenko packet into water or your favorite milk. Shake it up and take on the day. Expensive store-bought smoothies are sugar-packed calorie bombs. And fresh-pressed oh, juices worst. have way less fiber. They're even worse. Not Kenko's enough fiber. breakfast Exactly. Kenko's <laughs> breakfast smoothies are only made from organic whole fruits and vegetables, flash frozen oh. and slow dried to lock in all the fiber and nutrients. Nothing added and no fiber taken out. Go to Genko.com, take their quick nutrition quiz. Oh, I would fail it. And fill your flexible monthly order with your choice of 15 functional flavors that match your goals and taste. Each Kenko smoothie costs less than three bucks and packs half the daily fruits and vegetables. I don't like that word packs. I just, uh, I, I feel weighted down by that and gives you 
the daily fruits and vegetables you need to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and some cancers. And you should even take this if you want type 2 diabetes and heart disease and some cancers <laughs> because it's fantastically it's just a fantastic smoothie even it's, even if no, that's you're no, not trying to avoid gonna, that stuff it's going to help you avoid those things by having right. a healthy but smoothie but even if you don't want to avoid those things you're going to want these smoothies because they're delicious and they are they do what they say they're going to do i mean uh first and they're kind of beautifully color coded so like i did ambers recently which is amber and it's passion fruit banana dates apple uh baobab powder yellow beetroot and uh, some other stuff. Anyway, um, that's to repair your body. And my body, Paula, is repaired. I saw you on Zoom a few <laughs> minutes ago. You look fantastic. Thank you. I was uh, repaired. S- start creating I once health- was broke, but no, 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 now no, no. repaired. Not the same thing. It's not the same was. thing. Start creating okay. healthy habits right now. Go to kinko.com slash Paula. Pick out your flexible monthly plan, and the first 100 listeners, wow, hurry, 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 will get 25% off your first order. That's a good deal. That's a great deal. That's kenko.com slash Paula, and you can get 25% off, but only if you're one of the first 100 callers. No. Okay. Yeah, you better get there before yeah. before Winnie a, 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 yeah. and Mike Boom Boom Bonifant. <laughs> Yeah, you got to get there. If you're one of the first 100, you got 25% off. You love this show. We love you. So get this special deal. 25% off for the first 100 listeners at K-E-N-C-K-O dot com slash Paula. Fun fact, the French language Scrabble world champion doesn't speak French, which is totally French. <laughs> and we're back. Paula Poundstone, you know, from time to time, you have called up, you are called upon to describe our little podcast, which has now been running more than two years. And in all those two years, you haven't really figured out how to describe it. I still can't do it. I say it's it, I, the first thing I say is it's it's not a cult. That's the first. Like if I'm doing a radio interview and they go, oh, you have a podcast, don't you? And I say, yeah, yeah. I do. It's called Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. It's not a cult. That's the first thing I say. <laughs> I go, it's me and okay. my partner, Adam Felber. And then, I mean, we have on an expert on a topic and we make and then there's a book club. Huh? That's yeah. how I describe it. Yeah, you're yeah. You, you're wearing me out with your failure to describe it. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, not good. Well, I'm not good at it. <laughs> but, you know, fortunately, our nobodies have stepped up with brief Wait descriptions a minute. of the show. Wait Adam. Adam. What? Oh, my gosh. What? Answer the phone. How come I never hear that when you hear it? Okay. Um. Hello? Hello, Adam. Is that you? <laughs> yes. Is this Cher I Eva? I knew it. I knew it. This is Cher Eva. Your psychic, it. personal, professional psychic. Am I the hundredth caller? Um, no, Sherry, but you're you're not. Um, uh, you don't even have to be a psychic to know that you're not the hundredth caller because the hundredth caller contest ended two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It did. Yes. I knew it. I knew it. Did, did you? Because I, you just asked me. <laughs> I do. I knew it. I knew. I wish I could hang out with you after the Super Bowl. Although I won't be good company, I I already know who the winners are. The Niners um, uh, win. Sherry. <laughs> wow. It's the Niners um, all the way. Well, well, no. See, sure, sure. Even the, the Super Bowl alert. also. Niners, Niners. <laughs> the, the Super Bowl also just happened, and the Niners weren't even in it. I'm sensing some negativity, Adam. And a house <laughs> with negativity is so difficult for your 16 year old daughter Tiffany to be in. <laughs> I don't have a 16 year old daughter named <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> Oh no! Did she leave home? No, no. I, I, I simply don't have. <laughs> it's that, it's that's the not, negativity, uh, I, Adam. It's just so difficult 
for a 16-year-old girl to be around that. <laughs> what, like, I, 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 I don't know what to say. My daughter's not 16, and her name is not uh, whatever you said it was, Tiffany. No, not now, Adam. Uh, listen, Shereva, I've got some work to do. I have to go. I knew it. I knew it. We'll talk soon. <laughs> okay. Um. Bye. Uh, bye, Adam. I'll, 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 I'll put a light around you and your partner, Vanessa. <laughs> Her name is not Vanessa. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, Shereva. Bye-bye. Okay, well, now that that's out of the way, Paula, um, so we have these listeners, we have our nobody submitting show descriptions, right? And we're, and some of those show descriptions are actually up on your website, paulapoundstone.com. They very yeah. attractively cycle uh, so, through, they fade the, in and out. The nobody's come up with great show descriptions, and I'm assuming, Tony Anita Hull, that tonight will not be the exception to that. You're right. So, Tony Anita Hall, do you have do you have some descriptions? I do, I do. So, our first one is from Michael Thackeray from Arlington, Massachusetts. The most useful nonsense you can find anywhere: a veritable gallimaufry of expert knowledge and piquant batonage. Ooh, Ooh, I like that, Michael. That's very accurate. Um, I, I don't think badinage. Pe- fantastic. Pecan hasn't been a word before, but badinage, uh, uh, which is uh, what was it? Uh, it was, it's sort of a playful argument. Is that right? Y- uh, yeah, I think so. It's a discussion of some kind, right? Yeah, yeah. Like um, banter. I, it's banter. That's what it is. Banter. Thank yeah. you. Um, like when I say, for example, let's uh, Adam. Let's give him a little piquant. What does piquant mean? I don't know what piquant means. Tony, you want to Google that? Uh, <laughs> no, it, 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 it's, it's like a, it's like spicy. Oh, spicy. Oh, all right. So spicy, playful banter. All right. Let's, uh, we're going to give him an example. Okay, here we go. Fuck you, Adam. Okay. Fuck you, Paula. <laughs> that, that's piquant badinage. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's amazing. It was so witty, Nespa. Yeah. Oh, oh, I love it when you speak German to me. Um, <laughs> well, All right, let's you, get another Michael. one, that's, Tony. That's a good one. All right, go ahead, Tony. <laughs> um, this one comes from Gord Borsa from Florida. The, the Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone podcast is possibly the most telling sign of an oncoming apocalypse. Respectfully. Gord Borsa from Florida. Oh, there you go. Wow. wow. I'm not sure that's a compliment. No. <laughs> well, I don't know what the world is is purportedly supposed to be like um, uh, as the apocalypse comes. Is the apocalypse the, hilarious? I, well, no, he's talking about before, the oncoming oh. apocalypse. Yeah, do things get really funny and feel really good just before? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Does the Book of Revelation say, and lo, an extreme hilarity moved upon the land, but followed by it was the beast? I I don't recall that. You know, I have a friend who is a um, Jehovah's Witness, and she has felt it was a good idea in the past to give me like one of those little booklets and it has right. uh, there, there was one that she gave me one time that had an illustration of a lion and a lamb and a man and a woman because this is something she yes. tells me all the time that the lion and lamb will lay down together. I mean, she hands me In this the kingdom pamphlet, of heaven, sure. And I'm thinking, you know what? And who's gonna get stuck cleaning up the waste? You want to bet it's me? I don't want any part of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. I I, I, I don't <laughs> want any part of the afterlife. It's not. It sounds like a lot of sifting. I don't want it. Yeah, well, I, I I agree. I would agree with you there. Um, but thank you, Gord Borsa. And by the way, if you're ever in Florida and, and you're at a restaurant, try the Gord Borsa. It is delicious. It's a cheese. <laughs> is it not a cheese? Uh, the Gord Borsa is a very uh, 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 people have died from the Gord Borsa. That's a very dangerous cheese. 
<laughs> not, not sure it's a cheese, uh, Mrs. Culpepper. I, I'm certain that it is a cheese, Adam Felber. I believe it is a cheese. <laughs> the Gord Borsa. <laughs> I think you might be confusing the Gord Borsa with uh, Gouda. The Gouda? Uh, uh, yes, the Gouda is very dangerous. Uh, the, 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 the Gord Gouda. Uh, the Gord Borsa is a, no, that's a cheese. It's a, it's, you can get tyrotoxism from that. Tyrotoxism? Nobody gets that anymore, Mrs. Culpepper. It's just a myth. No, that's not true. People do uh, get the the the, the, the tyrotoxism from the uh, cheese. I've dairy, never heard of anyone product. who's gotten it's a, that. It's a poison in Adam Felber from cheese or, or, or dairy products. It's very dangerous. Uh, no, it isn't. I, I mean, I've never heard of anybody personally who who's perished from uh, t- uh, tyrotoxism. Well, in fact, you have, but my husband, Captain Culpepper... Uh, uh, drop dead of the uh, uh, taro toxism. Uh, uh. I am I, I so sorry, Mrs. Culpepper. You I, seem to have I, a kind I, of a blind spot, if you will, on that topic, because I'm sure I've told you before. I, I'm mortified that I forced you to keep reliving this terrible memory. It's a painful um, episode, Adam Felber. A painful episode. It must have been. It's been I, I don't brought know what's back with to me by Gordon keep... Borsa. <laughs> well, Gord Borsa. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Culpepper. I'm sorry that your your husband, uh, Captain Culpepper, ate some bad Gord Borsa. No, he did not eat the Gord Borsa. It was the good of the god of Adam Felber. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony. Belly up to the mic. I want to hear another one. We've got nobody listens to Paula Poundstone is like an adult gas Frida. You're not sure you like it while it's happening, but you feel so much better afterward. <laughs> Anna Jean Petro from Portland, Oregon. Oh, wow. She could have gone with nose Frida, but no, she went straight to the gas Frida, which is the device that you use to remove windy <laughs> the gas passer it's called by the way to- oh yeah, so it's yeah. not yeah. called we, the gas we, we had frida. conflated it with the nose frida but it's a gas frida and it's eventually it's essentially the device you use to remove gas from baby's butts mm-hmm. yes uh, tony Correct. don't sound so damn cheery about it she, mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 you so, know, Paula, we're being re- re- compared to a, a an adult flatulence device. I, yeah, you know. By the way, I, I just want to say about the the windy the gas passer or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that human beings and frankly animals, because I live with a lot of them, have been just fine at passing gas with no help whatsoever for many many years. Yeah, I, I would say I would say you're right. Uh, but apparently, you know what I'm guessing, and I haven't Googled it, and I know that Tony will as soon as I say it. But I'm guessing that that some babies have trouble passing gas. I don't think so. Um, well, anyways, <laughs> uh, Anna Gepetto, thank you, Anna Gian Petro. Thank, uh, mm-hmm. uh, thank you very much for from Portland, Oregon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for. Uh, yeah, so you feel so much better <laughs> afterwards. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tony, you got any others? Uh, I've got one more from uh, Proud Nobody J. Coder. Nobody listens to Paula Poundstone is like a mystery meat sandwich. Skeptical at first glance, but once you take a bite, you realize it's worth another taste. Well, thank you, you know, Jay Coder. I, I gotta say, what is so what is so initially off putting about our podcast? What the fuck? So every one of these is like, oh, you know what? Paula Poundstone's podcast is like runny shit. You don't like it at first, but you're relieved that it's over. What, what, what is going on? You're terrible. <laughs> Well, no, there's a no. I think it, no. You're looking at it the wrong way. I, I think that <laughs> everyone is saying that dis, despite maybe some some gullies and valleys, that overall uh, they feel like it's it, it's sort of like the vaccine. You know, um, uh, it, it, it's you're better off taking it. That's the feeling I'm getting. I'm no, I'm getting this feeling that like it's all like, you know, Paula Poundstone's podcast is like rotten fruit. It smells terrible. But in the <laughs> desert, you might need it. <laughs> it's like 
every single one of these. Every single one of these is like, it's a mystery meat sandwich. You're not sure at first. It's an adult gas reader. You're not sure you like it. But <laughs> <laughs> the fuck, people? <laughs> I yeah. we're all sweet. No, nobody's <laughs> making you listen to this show, people. No, no. No, that's my point, Adam, is that they're doing it freely. They, they, you know, there's millions of podcasts for heaven's sakes. And, and, uh, so they sampled our podcast and they, they weren't sure in the beginning. And then they felt like, yeah, it was a good thing to do. So thank you very much. Uh, very, you know. <laughs> well, Paul and I have different opinions about this. I, I, I'm going to reserve my thank yous. <laughs> you know, Adam, I'd, I'd like to take, I'd like to take this moment to engage in a little bit of piquant badinage. Okay. Fuck you, Adam. Ah, fuck you, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that was good. That's the kind of stuff that makes this show work. Yeah, that's what's what's making them come back. They said at first I thought it was kind of stupid, but then I I heard some of the peak and badinage, and I said, whoa, those guys are playing with a load of deck, man. (laughs) This podcast is like, I don't know. I'm not even going to go there. Um, <laughs> it's sort of like uh, it, it, yeah. it, it's sort of like when you retch your guts out, uh, but <laughs> but fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Eventually, you feel better. Yeah, we're getting a lot of sort of salted caramel kind of kind of compliments here. You know, like right. Yeah. Yeah, ew, but hey. Yeah, it's all like right. well, Tony, Tony, it's thank like you when for those. you those drive your car <laughs> off a cliff, and at first you're like, "Fuck, we're gonna die," and then you notice, nice view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it. I'm taking. I'm taking it. I, 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 these are all lovely right, compliments. Right. Nobody's. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Tony, thank you for that. Uh, that. Um, <laughs> Piquant list of, uh, yeah. of of backhanded compliments. Yeah, I didn't thank you. Realize uh, they they are so backhanded. They are yes, all they're, no they're every single bit. one of them. Yeah, <laughs> they're backhanded with a spin. Um, Tony, I'm I want to. So sorry, I didn't even notice. It. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. It's like when your whole arm is sheared off by a big plate glass window that you fall into. Uh, and then you wake up in the hospital and you get those socks with the rubber grippy things on the bottom. I love those. I feel so bad. I really feel dick. <laughs> getting, sh- getting shot in the leg. And at first you're like, that's really painful. And then you're like, hey, free morphine. Yeah, it's it's like when you're seeing eye dog <laughs> eat some chocolate and just drops dead in front of you. And then you're digging a hole to bury him a- a- and you find a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> you find a quarter. Yeah. It's like when your house burns to the ground and you go back and, and somewhere in the ashes you, you find your iPhone charger so there's a positive yeah there's a, that's exactly what our podcast is like yeah these are excellent descriptions and and thank you Tony for finding them um uh, Tony and it all, I especially want to thank you for taking cuz I know how hard it must have been to take a few minutes to to get those descriptions off of Facebook or email without Googling. And so I am really proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Paula, what's going on in the, in the Poundstone product empire this week? Oh, my gosh, Adam. PaulaPoundstone.com is the Sears catalog of comedy and comedy merchandise. Listeners can exercise with my workout videos or grab more laughs. At Nobody Asked You, starring Paula Poundstone, my goofy homemade game show. They can go to the store at paulapoundstone.com to uh, 
order uh, to find my remarkably soft tri poly blend t shirt with the self portrait on the left breast and a memorable quote on the back perfect for warm weather or for layering in the cold. Um, I would tell you more, but Heidi. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I hate to say this, Heidi, but um, uh, over in the Felberlands, um, uh, the, the Starburn Sports simulcast is going full throttle. Paula, we have covered pro golf and pro and NBA basketball in the last two weeks, and it's been a gas. And if you want to take part in it and um, listen to it and also be a caller on it, all you got to do is go to Stereo.com slash Adam Felber, and then you can uh, download that free stereo app and be part of the dialogue. That sounds great. Well, you and I have been having conversations on Stereo, Paul, and it's been really fun. You know what it's been like, Adam? What? <laughs> <laughs> What's it been like, Paula? Yeah, it's been like when you can you can barely fucking breathe, like he's COPD, you know, like there's an elephant yeah. sitting on your chest, uh -huh. and then he rolls right. over. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I how I find those conversations. It's yeah. it's a little like when the bully isolates you from everybody else in school and in front of everybody, t pantses you and then repeatedly punches you in the face, and then the next day you find out that everybody feels bad for you and they let you have like uh, you know wherever you want to sit in the cafeteria. Yeah. It's very much like that. I, I I was not able to put my finger on the exact description, but that's it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> All right, subscribe to this podcast, everybody. It's free. You'll get it every week at no charge. If there is a subject or topic you'd like to know about, tell us. We're open to suggestions, and we're at nobody listens to Paula Poundstone at gmail.com. Once again, that's nobody listens to Paula Poundstone at gmail.com, and that Ladies and gents, is our show. Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone is hosted by Paula Poundstone and yours truly, Adam the Felber. Special thanks to our guest, Rachel Bernstein. I'll join her cult Yay! any day. And, and thanks to our house band, Madeline Eaton. Thanks, Madeline. She's a member of the all-female Celtic band, Bancara. Check them out at BancaraBand.com. Our show is presented by Paula Poundstone, Adam Felber, Bonnie Burns, Ken Lezebnik, and Tony Anita Hull. Mixing by Michael Hoagie, Starburns production by Land Romo, transcription services for the show provided by Transcribe Me, a premier internationally used transcription service. Use code Paula Poundstone when placing your order at transcribeme.com to receive an expedited service. That's our show for tonight. Won't somebody please listen to me? So, uh, Paula, I can, uh, joined a cult. <laughs> well, well, uh... Just now. Just, like, just a second ago? Yeah. Would you do it online? Is it an online cult? It's an online cult. Why? Wow. It's, huh? yeah, it's a Costco, Costco cult. Did you sign anything yet? Don't sign anything. Oh, no, I signed up. I, I'm oh, now shit. a member of Costco. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. You're gonna... Well... You're going to get some big boxes. Yeah, I mean, it's they promised box. me big boxes. It's a big box cult. Yes, that's exactly right. So I can't talk to you anymore. It's funny because I can't talk to you anymore either. You know why? A lot of friction. Why? A lot of friction. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fraught relationship. Yeah, I'm going to have to work this out through a therapist of some sort. <laughs> We're going to need to call her up. Rachel. I'm not calling I'm her. Really you call her. Really trying to get free therapy. No, you call her. <laughs> you call her. You call her. Star Avenue, a podcast. <clears throat> a podcast network.